Thank you, Ray, for the kind introduction. Dear audience, I very much appreciate for the organizers having been given me the opportunity to, to give a speech on this uh, very prominent event. To start with, uh, I'm now trying to add the view of an agronomist, a grassland um, scientist, and my experience and experimental focus is on temperate grasslands with a strong focus on European grasslands. Now, the title of my speech can be regarded as a hypothesis. Diverse use for diverse services being related to sustainability. What we have seen over decades is simplification in grassland management, but also in the way the grazers or the ruminant livestock is kept. And this, had, this made the systems simpler, and this also referred to the grassland system. So there are two aspects. The one is the ruminant system that is relying on the grass, and the other is the grazer or the, life, the individual livestock itself. To start with, this is a view on Lake Lucerne. It's the part of the world where I come from. Not exactly, this is Switzerland. In Germany, we have similar alpine settings. Not as nice as in Switzerland, but anyhow. And what it demonstrates is a landscape from an agricultural view that is dominated by grasslands. Of course, it is a nice setting. It's exactly the time we have now. It's greenish, but the mountains are still covered with snow. And, but the, the land use is mainly grasslands. And those of you who sit in the front of the audience they may have spotted the fence lines. So it's grazed grassland, but it's also cut grassland. And obviously, this type of grasslands provide a huge range of services. At first place, the cultural service, it's evident. But there is more. There is a scattered landscape, highly diverse, structured one. We can see that the vegetation of the grass is obviously different depending on how it has been utilized, whether it is a pasture or a meadow. It's old grassland, so it stores a lot of carbon in the soil. It, at, the same, at the same time, it is covered nicely by vegetation, so it prevents surface runoff and erosion. And uh, mind you, it produces an excellent product, it's the mountain cheese. So this situation gives us uh, a picture of a sustainable, obviously sustainable grassland system with a high biodiversity. Now putting this into data, I would like to show you results from a study that we did in Lower Saxony, in a, in a county close by, Göttingen, where I am based. And we investigated the species diversity, higher plants. This is our particular interest, is matching production and biodiversity. So where we looked at the um, abundance of higher plants in relation to the management, and we compared meadows and pastures, and we looked at the various scales of diversity. And what you can see on the left-hand side is the total number of higher plants that were found in that region. And it was for meadows 120, and for the pastures 160. So we call this the gamma diversity. So this is the diversity that it ho is hosted by the pasture type of grassland in, uh, and compared to the meadow type of grassland. 20% of that diversity can be traced back to the paddock level. 
So we, we, of the overall diversity, we find 20% of it at the paddock level. So that means 80% of that diversity is not found within the paddocks, but between. It's the beta diversity. So what does it mean? It means that when we look at the biodiversity service of grassland, we have to consider the scale. It's not only about a single paddock, but it's the diversity of a setting in a region or an area. And I should stress here, and you can see this on the right-hand side of this figure, is that the main difference is the rare species. So the pastures obviously covered much more rare species than the meadows. And this is quite interesting from a nature conservation point of view. Now, this is to demonstrate the uh, management and the different trophic conditions that you find in an area in relation to the grassland use. And now I will do two steps to give evidence for my hypothesis that I introduced. The main one, the relationship between uh, grassland use and ecosystem service provision. And I will do this at first place looking at the systems level. So how is the livestock system look, looking like that provides the services of the grassland? And in the second step, I will look at the individual animal and the effect on the services. So the starting point is the provision of grassland-related ecosystem services is scale dependent. And the heterogeneity at landscape scale is important to ensure the continuous provision of ecosystem services. And this heterogeneity is due to spatial variability. And this is the, the, the trophic conditions, but it's also the grassland management, and even more so the interaction among both. And Finally, if we have understood this relationship, then we can consider that when we increase uh, the, the way of livestock husbandry, the, the types of grassland husbandry, uh, and there with the number of different feed requirements, then there is potential also to, uh, um, to, to, provide, to better provide services. Okay, to start with, the grassland-based production systems. And I will, will give you an example at first place where we looked or compared two types of uh, grassland-based production systems with ruminants, which are common in Europe, is the beef and the dairy. And usually it's said that the beef, it's suckler cows, they are less demanding. So there is no need to produce the highest forage quality so there should be room for providing biodiversity. This was our assumption when we started. So we compared, we did pairwise uh, suckler and dairy business, and we looked again at the different scales of diversity. And what we found is that what we expected, the alpha diversity of the grasslands that were managed by dairy farms uh, was lower compared to the alpha diversity of the beef cattle farms. But interestingly, this was not true for the gamma diversity. So when we looked at the diversity that is hosted by the whole farm, there is no difference. How can that be explained? Now the reason for this is that uh, at a farm level and even the, even the dairy farm level, there are different groups of different requirements in terms of feed quality. It's not only the lactating cow, but it's the dry cows, it's the heifers in first and second year, and so on, and the fourth. And obviously, the farmers were able to match those different demands with a different provision of the grasslands, which, uh, to sum up, gave them the opportunity to host quite a number of species comparable to the more extensively, generally more extensively, bee farm. Now, looking 
into this a bit deeper, we asked whether the grassland management, which is again related to how the animals are kept in general, how the grassland management is related to biodiversity services. And we asked, does grazing make a difference? And we compared, that was again an observational study on farm, we compared uh, sort of triplets, uh, uh, zero grazing farms with exercise grazing, it's all dairy, exercise grazing farms and uh, full grazing, we call it full grazing, is more than 14 hours of grazing. And what we find, again, the gamma level of diversity, so the diversity that is hosted by the farm as a whole was highest where grazing was applied a lot or where, the, where there was, was most grazing. Um, so we, we looked a bit closer why this is the case. And again, it's the attitude, the mindset, and the knowledge of the farmer that uh, adopts grazing, which is obviously different to the farmer who is only cutting the grass. So the farmer who does grazing is aware that the herbage mass and the herbage quality is highly variable in the vegetation period. So when you do a proper grazing, you have to manage, apply the right forage in the right time to the cows. So it means you have to have a very clear mind on the development and the heterogeneity of the herbage that is available of, on the farm. And this obviously helps to get a proper and differentiated management of the grasslands, which, which then at the end improves the service. There was one other point related to this is, we also looked at the type of grasslands that is available on these particular firms, and this is shown in uh, the right figure. This is, uh, well, the, in particular the farmers who do grazing, they have the uh, heavily grazed, or intensively grazed by lactating dairy cows, the pastures, then they have the pastures for the dry cows, they have the pastures for the heifers, and then maybe they have the, the silage meadows and the hay meadows, and some, some may also have uh, meadows under, under agri-environmental schemes, so they, they have a quite, quite large number of types of grasslands that they manage, and of course this type, this functional type of grasslands is also positively related with the overall diversity at the farm level. Another example, looking at how the dairy is managed in relation to the output on the grassland side. And again, it's biodiversity. Here we did a comparison throughout Germany in three larger regions, north, central, and southern Germany. And it was again a pairwise uh, 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 approach. Actually, it was a quartet. So we had three regions, two farming systems, and farming systems means it was either conventional farming or organic farming. And then we had two levels of feed supply. The one was a mainly grassland base with a low input of concentrates, and the other was a, a situation where a high level of concentrates was applied. And what we find quite interestingly is looking first at the alpha diversity of the grassland managed by that farm is that there was an effect of the farming system, which was not really surprising, so the organic farms had slightly higher biodiversity. But what was not expected, or at least we were uh, uh, pretty much uh, astonished about that, was that those farms that apply low levels of concentrates had a higher biodiversity. So the diversity at the farm level was related to the feeding strategy of the dairy, be it based purely on grass with a low level of concentrates or with a high level of concentrates making less use of uh, the, the grasslands. And this difference in the concentrate level was mainly expressed for the conventional farms. And 
this was also true not only for the alpha level, but also for the beta diversity. So that means the differences between the different grassland sites within a farm, and of course the, the gamma level as well. And again, uh, this result was related to the, the type, how the grasslands within a farm is managed, and you could, we, we introduced a, a, a variable trying to explain the variability of grassland management by identifying grass products. And those grass products are different sorts of like silage, silage, fresh grass, raised silage, uh, intensively, extensively, uh, hay, and so on. And what we found is that the number of grass products that is being produced at farm level is again positive correlated with the species uh, number, uh, again, at the various spatial, uh, various spatial scales within the farm. And again, to, to show the importance of the variability of feed requirements at the farm level for biodiversity and other services of the grasslands, this is uh, data compiled of uh, different grass products and how that can be used within a farm. And when you feed dairy, lactating dairy cows, of course, there is a high demand for high quality herbage. There is no way out. But if you look at the heifers or the dry cows, or if you look at suckling cows, there is, uh, uh, the, the, the requirement is generally lower and there is a larger variability or possibility to use various sources of quality. And when you go for sheep or horses, this may, depending on how intensively horses are kept, this is adding another opportunity to utilize herbage of various quality. Now coming to the grazer, uh, to the individual. And to start with, I'm coming back to this very nice picture. And I was happy to find a picture from the same place 220 years earlier. This is an etching by a Swiss artist, Peter Biermann, and it's the same setting you may identify. And broadly looking at it, it is similar to what we see today. It's a scattered landscape, well, it's a nice setting. It's a scattered landscape. It's dominated by grassland. There are woody elements throughout, but they are scattered. It's highly structured. You could say it's a park-like landscape. The interesting thing is the uh, artist intuitively put uh, the actor of this scenery into the fall. And this is the grazing animal. And it's a communal grazing area. And you see the herdsman. And you see the animals, well, ranging through. This is a traditional way of communal grazing in Central Europe. So the animals belong to the farmers. And the land is communal land. And so what, what uh, is, is important in this respect is that this type of landscape has been shaped by the grazers. So the grazer is the ecological engineer that made this landscape, and it was related to the preferences of the animal. This is important. The grazing preferences, the spatial prefer preferences. And this landscape is, I mean, you can't see, but the origin of the diversity of this landscape, also the biodiversity, is this communal grazing and is the grazer. Now, we were looking, taking this idea, looking at particular effects of the grazer on a biodiversity issue. And this is a data from a long-term experiment. In Europe, we are happy that we get quite nice support from European funding, and we have international consortia, and this is one example of it for BioBean, which was originally started in, in the UK. Um, and it's a very simple experiment. We simply compared three different grazing intensity treatments on long-term old permanent grasslands. It's not intensively fertilized. It's, it's, it's low, low level 
Uh, and the, the idea is, can we combine production and biodiversity in an agricultural context? It's, it's not a landscape management or so, it's an agricultural context. And you, you see, we have three different, we define the grazing intensity in target sward heights, and we try to maintain with set stocking the sward height over the time. And um, what we looked at, these are data from the first 10 years of this experiment, is we can't really see big differences in the overall biodiversity at the paddock scale uh, uh, depending on the grazing intensity. There is a slight advantage of the very lenient grazing. So more extensive may have a slight advantage. Uh, but we could find effects on butterfly and grasshopper diversity. And to give it a bit more in detail, we see here after 10 years, uh, we had a higher uh, butterfly and a higher grasshopper species diversity on the lenient and very lenient grazing treatments. And we also had a higher abundance, even more so, even more prominent. So there is an effect of the grazing intensity on the biodiversity outcome. We also looked at the production level, and this is data over almost 20 years now. Uh, this, uh, the curve represents the different uh, pasture performances of those places. And what you can see is, of course, with the moderate grazing, which is the intensive one treatment, we have higher performance per area. But quite interestingly, the variability uh, among years is not different between the different grazing intensity. So not necessarily the extensive ones uh, are more resilient to rainfall things and so on. So it's, it's, there was no, really no, no difference. So this is the per area performance. We also looked at the individual performance, and quite interestingly, there was no difference among the different grazing treatments. So you could quite nicely uh, fulfill the requirements of a suckler cow, a beef cattle, uh, on a very extensive pasture, uh, uh, so the life weight gains were similar. This is, this is important to consider. Uh, it depends on the land, whether you can afford. Now, taking this, we were interested in what animals are really doing. So can we trace back effects we can see in the sward? Can we trace it back to how the grazing, grazer behaves? And this is data uh, where we mounted GPS loggers, trackers on, on the animal, and we were looking at the activity of the animals, and this is data on the walking distances of the grazers, the same experiment. And you find, I mean, probably all, you all know, you find diurnal pattern, these are characteristic for grazing activity at pasture. Uh, and there is not big difference between uh, the different grazing treatments. So there is a, an overriding effect of the day and the, the requirements when they are hungry, when they feed, there's the morning and the evening meal usually, so you have a diurnal pattern. You can take this data and trace it back to, to the area, and then you get such a figure, a heat map of activity of animals on that particular pasture. And then you can trace back where the animals have been grazing or have been active, and you may look at the sward. And what you then find is such situation, although we have defined a target sward height, this, the sward is not uniform. It's highly variable. And patches develop over time, as you can see here, and the grazing intensities, the difference, they differ in the amount of the different patches to the overall uh, grass sward. So we have short, intermediate, and tall. And what we then did, we looked at the ecosystem services at the patch level. And we there is obviously a difference in the amount of herbage being produced depending on the patch, but there is also a difference in the vegetation composition, in the carbon turnover, and probably also in the root turnover and the carbon sequestration. And um, what we look first is, are these patches that developed within a reasonably short time at the start of the experiments, are these patch uh, patches stable over time? And yes, they are, they are very stable. So this can be seen from, from this figure. 
where we um, classified the, the patches and the dark blue and the dark red means it is stable over, uh, over uh, 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 more than 10 years. So you, you find a shortly grazed patch over a period of 10 years. We stop that, you still find it also, you also find it after 20 years. So it is rather stable. And the interesting thing is you have the same overall conditions at that particular place, the generally same trophic conditions, but you have completely different management, defoliation uh, and nutrient return. And this is quite interesting to study the effect of the grazer on the ecosystem service outcome. Now, this is an example to extend. Uh, on the left-hand side on top, you see, you see the sward structure. And then you see the relative density of grazing and of non-grazing. So non-grazing means resting. And from this, you can deduce the nutrient turnover because the nutrients are obviously more concentrated on that places where the animals rest. And you can see it on the uh, uh, bottom uh, right-hand side. You have spots of higher nutrients. So that means within a paddock, you have a nutrient transfer from uh, tightly grazed patches to leniently grazed patches with consequences for further uh, crop growth rate uh, and, and carbon, carbon turnover. And this also has then consequences for biodiversity. So this is again, it's the patch scale. It's not the grazing treatment scale, it's the patch scale. And you, and you find uh, the patches uh, of the, the same patch between different grazing intensities have similar behavior. So we have a higher diversity in the tightly grazed patch than in the tall grazed patch. This is due to competition a competition of uh, tall growing species outcompete the small ones. Uh, we have a nutrient transfer, as has been said, potassium content of the soil is higher in the tall patches. And we have, uh, which is also quite interesting, we have a high dissimilarity of the vegetation between the patches and is highest when you compare the short with the tall patches. It's a high uh, difference in, in vegetation composition between both, uh, those two patches. Another example, at, at the looking at the grazer, what, we, what we've seen was cattle. We are also interested in the, do different uh, grazer species make a difference in the way ecosystem services are being provided. And we had the hypothesis that we may match different preferences, for example, cattle and sheep, do we, doing mixed grazing and uh, thereby uh, 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 summing up benefits of, of behavior in, in terms of outputs. And uh, this was an experiment where we uh, manipulated the grass sward. We had either a grass-dominated sward and a biodiverse sward containing a lot of dicots. And we had three treatments, mono-grazing cattle, mixed-grazing cattle sheep, Th those were uh, uh, calves, uh, cows with calves and, and ewes with lambs, uh, and we had pure sheep grazing. And what we, what we found is uh, that obviously the diversity was or the, uh, measured in evenness, uh, plant species evenness, was higher in uh, the mixed grazing compared to the mono grazing. So there was a benefit, and there was also a benefit in life weight gain, in particular for the lambs. So there was a higher production, life weight gain, of, of the lambs uh, in that particular system. Okay, now we have seen the grazing system level and the more individual grazer level. And uh, we are in particular interested in looking at grazing systems of the future. And how can we improve grazing can do targeted grazing management in order to better uh, manage and balance trade-offs. Um, and this, did, uh, and, and in general, I should say, uh, grazing management means having the animals at the right place in the right time. And doing so means you have to fence. So the art of grazing is fencing. This is quite obvious. Um, and so when you, when you know a particular status of the grass sward, like the herbage mass, 
the herbage quality. It might also be uh, uh, particular plants that you would like to, to flower because of, of pollinators uh, support or bird feeding. Uh, it could also be a uh, chicken from meadow birds, which you want to, 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 to have to grow up. Uh, so you have, to, you have to have knowledge on the status of the grass ward in order to set the fences properly. And there are now a range of uh, smart farming, smart grassland farming technologies around that can be adopted to improve the knowledge of the sward status as well as of the animal, what the animal is doing. And I'm, I'm not going into the details. This is a compilation of the different uh, technology that is available, like remote sensing, either drone-based or satellite-based, RGB uh, uh, imagery, hyperspectral imagery, uh, LIDAR. You may, may, you may be aware of the, the opportunities. Uh, at, at the livestock level, you've got GPS trackers, as I have shown. Uh, you have bite recorders, uh, pedometers, so you can quite nicely document what the animal is doing, at what time and where. Uh, and you may also go to, to, to the landscape or the society or the decision-making level to adopt those new technologies. Like the landscape, you can, take, you can identify the, st the structure of the landscape, as we've, as we've seen, is quite important. Uh, the society, you could do documentation of what you've done. You can trace back the grazer and you can give this information to the consumer. Well, my animals were, had been grazing on a place where flowering was possible. You can, you can give evidence for this and, and uh, certify your, your, your premium product, for example. You can give this information also to politics uh, when, you, when you apply agri-environmental schemes and, and so forth. And of course, at the end, it's also important for decision making. There is, there is a, a now, now a lot of, of modelings and decision support tools available that can be used to, to support grazing and to support targeted, balanced, oriented and various ecosystem services um, grazing. And uh, to give you Ray, I've got some units still. Wow, wonderful. Um, I, give you, I give you some examples of where we are looking at. Uh, one is trying to get information on the status of the grass sward, which is key uh, at a high spatial and temporal resolution, which is key for grazing management. And this is a very drastic example. We are studying uh, a system where there is no uh, domestic livestock, but red deer grazing. It's a military training area in Germany, a huge one. And there's a huge herd of red deer. And the red deer is maintaining an open landscape. So it's a grazer. It maintains an open landscape. And uh, this is a place. It's a huge area, 2,500 hectares, at least for Europe. Um, it's, it's, it's a place with the highest biodiversity, grassland biodiversity we have in Germany. So it's extremely diverse. And the problem is we were interested to, to look at the effect of the grazer on the ecosystem services of the grasslands. But on military training area, it's, it's a bit dangerous to go there. <laughs> so there is an incentive to adopt other methods to get information on the grass ward. And that's why we used um, remote sensing, so this is the overall area, and we took one example of it. This is an area of some 300 hectares, and we used uh, satellite imagery. So in Europe we have the Sentinel system, and with a Sentinel you get every week a new image. So you have a high temporal resolution, and the spatial resolution is rather okay, 10 by 10. So you can live with it. So we were able to identify different vegetation types. And these are characterized, these are the, the figures. This is a common German system where we classify our vegetation types. So we were able to identify the different classes of vegetation in that area. And we were, in addition, able to scan the herbage mass and the herbage quality. And this is data also from satellite, where we, on the left-hand side, measured the compressed sward height as an indicator of available herbage mass. And we measured the protein by Sentinel. 
And what you can see is, uh, over, over uh, 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 two times, and what you can see is there is there's quite a bit of spatial variation I in the system. And with this, we, we then could, or we can use this data, not in the military training, but if we, if we adopt in a, in a domestic livestock system, we can use this data to, to graze at a larger scale and to allocate the animals in the right way we want it. So this different information on grass sward on the one hand and animals being traced, being, being tracked as I have shown before, can thus be used to target new systems, grazing systems. So we are aware of the traditional classification, like we have set stocking, rotational grazing, uh, strip grazing. Um, we thought about, I mean, it's, it's all about allocation of animals and allocated in a way that the efficiency of herbage utilization is high when you look at it from an agricultural perspective. You may extend it to other services. Uh, the, the problem with these traditional or established grazing systems is you have to fence. And the more you try to control the grazing, the more you have to fence. And of course, we have these movable fences and things. But there is new t technology now around, which is the virtual fencing. You may have heard of it. And we are, we are doing experiences with virtual fencing because we think we can utilize all these different information which we have at a high spatial and temporal res resolution. We can use it to better allocate the animal without any physical effort because you don't have to move a fence. You just put the fence on the mobile phone. And thereby you can fence out, for example, particular areas where you would like to have uh, food, uh, 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 seed producing uh, species for birds, or you have flowering species and, and so on. It's, it's no effort to fence out. And you can steer the animal through the landscape. And then finally you come back to what we have seen in this picture, in this uh, etching by Peter Biermann, the cow, the grazer as an ecological engineer and having this technology, all this information and match it, put it, the layers all together, we will be able to do new uh, grazing systems and we forget about set stocking and forget about rotational grazing. It's just, uh, uh, it's just controlled by the particular status at the particular uh, space uh, a, 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 on that uh, grace area. And, and with this, I, I would like to thank, oh, no, I should conclude, ah, sorry. Uh, I should conclude, I'm, I'm coming back to the hypothesis where I started. Yes, uh, the provision of ecosystem services is scale dependent, and the landscape scale has to be considered, it's quite important, and this matches with the interest or the opportunities a livestock husbandry manager has um, and the livestock is in general able to utilize the different spatial variability that we have, could be trophic or could be management. And uh, the more diverse the feed requirements of the stock of a farm is, the higher is the potential to adopt different uses and to provide different services. And smart farming technologies, smart grassland farming technologies will change our situation on, on grazing and we think uh, it will give a boost for those countries where uh, ruminants are kept indoors. Thanks for the attention. <laughs>